Today we're going to tell the 30 year long story of Magic the Gathering by looking at the most important card from every single year in the game's history. 1993 Black Lotus from Alpha. No longer really a game piece, over the years Black Lotus has turned into a sign of Magic's longevity and success. There's tens of millions of Magic players today, but only 20,000 copies of Black Lotus and only 4,000 of those are in Black Border, which means the most expensive copies sell for hundreds of thousands of dollars. In fact, Post Malone recently admitted to spending $800,000 on a single copy of the card. What is the highest amount of money you ever paid for a Magic the Gathering card? $800,000. It was an artist print, Chris Rush signed Black Lotus. 1994 Blood Moon from the Dark. Few cards from 1994 have stood the test of time, especially in competitive formats, but thanks to a community vote when 8th edition released, more than a decade after its original release in the dark, Blood Moon snuck its way into the modern format where it continues to wreck greedy mana bases to this day, keeping the enchantment relevant to a group of players who weren't even alive when it first was printed. 1994 Nicole Bolas from Chronicles. It takes a special set of circumstances for a reprint to be the most iconic and important card of its year, but that's where we find ourselves with Nicole Bolas in 1995. Well, Nicole Bolas has proven to be one of the most popular villains in Magic and still is printed in various versions today. The real reason it's on our list is its role in creating the reserve list. When Chronicles released in 1995, it reprinted many expensive cards from sets like Legends, which crashed the market and worried collectors. As a result, Wizards decided it was necessary to do something to calm the collectors' fears, which led to them creating a reserve list of cards that they promised to never reprint, a promise that Wizards continues to keep to this day, despite massive pushback from the community. 1996 Cadaverous Bloom from Mirage, a key piece to an early magic combo deck, the Pross Bloom deck, which used Cadaverous Bloom to generate mana to draw its deck with prosperity. Today, the enchantment is mostly an example of the rampant cheating and lack of ethics in the early day of professional magic play, thanks to an incident where Mike Long, one of the most well-known pros of his era, infamously was found with a copy of Cadaverous Bloom hiding in his lap. 1997, Vampiric Tutor from Visions, the most famous of a cycle of one mana tutors that took three years to complete. Alongside Mystical Tutor, Worldly Tutor, Enlightened Tutor, and Gamble, Vampire Tutor is still finding silver bullets in Commander today. 1998. Gaia's Cradle from Urza Saga. While Telerian Academy might be the most powerful of Urza Saga's rare land cycle, it was too strong for its own good, leading to it being banned in essentially every format. Meanwhile, this slightly less powerful Gaia's Cradle managed to dodge the ban hammer and today is a staple in both Legacy and Commander while commanding a price of nearly $1,000. 1999 Memory Jar from Urza's Legacy. 1999 was a broken era of magic, highlighted by a ton of ban bannings, but even in this sea of degeneracy, Memory Jar stands out above the pack. At the time, bannings happened on a regular schedule, once each quarter, except for Memory Jar. The artifact was so broken and dominant that it led to an air of magic known as Combo Winner, which in turn led to Wizards emergency banning the card off schedule for the first time in the game's history. 2000 Ristic Study from Prophecy After the brokenness of Urza's block and Combo Winner, Wizards intentionally pulled back on the power level of new sets to such an extent that the most important card of 2000 has the honor of being the only common on our list, Ristic Study. The best of a bunch of Ristic cards that allowed you to fizzle your opponent's effects by paying some amount of mana, Ristic Study was fairly useless when it was printed, but it gained a new life with the advent of Commander a decade later where it quickly emerged as one of the strongest cards in the multiplayer format. 2001 Entomb from Odyssey. The second year of the post-combo winner Power Down, very few cards from 2001 still see play today, but the biggest exception is in Tomb, with the one mana graveyard tutor being essential to any reanimator deck across formats, allowing for the most unbeatable plays like getting a Grizzlebrand or even Emrakul on the battlefield as early as turn 1. 2002 The Fetchlands from Onslaught. Arguably the most powerful mana fixing lands ever printed, the existence of Fetchlands changed the game of Magic by allowing decks in formats like Modern Legacy and Commander to play all 5 colors while still being able to cast their spells consistently. 2003 Solemn Simulacrum from Mirrodin. Designed by Invitational winner Jens Thorin, this sad robot
robot might look unassuming is the 2 2 for 4 but its combination of a ramping ETB trigger and a card drawing death trigger oozes value and gives Salim a home in many commander decks today 20 years after it was first printed. 2004 Sword of Fire and Ice from Dark Steel. In 2004 equipment was a brand new card type. Sword of Fire and Ice the best of the most iconic and still incomplete equipment cycle in the history of the game exemplifies the best that the type has to offer. 2005 The Shocklands from Ravnica. With the reserve list prohibiting the reprinting of the original dual lands eventually leading to a single copy costing hundreds of dollars the game needed a cheap playable replacement. In the first Ravnica set we got it in the Shocklands which have proven to be the next best thing to the original dual lands at a fraction of the dual lands price. Today often in tandem with fetch lands the Shocklands form the foundation of mana bases in Commander, Pioneer, Modern and when they're reprinted in Standard. 2006 Dark Depths from Cold Snap. More than a decade after the release of Ice Age Wizards finally finished Ice Age block with Cold Snap finally unleashing Merit Lage from the Dark Depths as a 2020 indestructible flyer which a few years later became a devastating combo piece in conjunction with cards like Vampire Hexmage and Thespian Stage freeing Merit Lage as early as turn one leading to Dark Depths being banned in multiple formats. 2007 Garrick Wildspeaker from Lorwyn. You can split the history of magic into two parts BP and AP before Planeswalkers and after Planeswalkers. In 2007's Lorwyn Wizards released the first cycle of five Planeswalkers pushing the game into the modern era as the card type quickly became not just the focus of gameplay where Planeswalkers are considered to be the most powerful type in the game but lore and flavor as well as magic story shifted from focusing on legendary creatures to Planeswalkers a trend that culminated a decade later with the much mocked Jastis League. 2008 Tezzeret the Seeker from Shards of Alara. While Tezzeret the Seeker is technically a Planeswalker, that's not why it's on our list today. In 2008's Shards of Alara, Wizards added a new rarity to the game, the mythic rarity designed to house the biggest, most epic, and strangest cards in Magic. Tezzeret the Seeker was the best of the first run of Mythics, putting it on our list. Over the years, the design philosophy on Mythics seems to have shifted a bit, where now Mythics are often the most powerful and expensive cards in the set, but regardless, there's no doubt that the rarity has had a huge impact on the game as a whole. 2009 Bane Slayer Angel from Core Set 2010. For the first 15 years of Magic, core sets were all reprints, but this changed with Magic 2010, the first core set to contain brand new cards, including Bane Slayer Angel. While it might not be as obvious today, thanks to the power creep of the past decade, Bane Slayer Angel was a jaw droppingly strong creature at the time it was printed as a 5 5 flyer for 5 with a ton of relevant abilities to the point where it was considered to be among the best creatures of all time. 2010, Jace the Mind Sculptor from Worldwake. By 2010, Planeswalkers had existed in Magic for about three years, and while they were thought of as powerful cards and saw a lot of play, it wasn't until the printing of Jace the Mind Sculptor in Worldwake that players got a glimpse of the card type's true power. Jace quickly became known as the best Planeswalker ever printed, was banned from Standard during an era where bannings essentially never happened, and then went on to dominate one of the strongest formats in Magic Legacy. 2011 Kalia of the Vast from Commander. Today we get so many Commander precon decks that their release isn't especially exciting. Getting a handful of precons is expected with each set release, but back in 2011 things were different. Commander was a relatively new format and supplemental products were scarce. When Wizards announced they were going to print a series of five Commander focused precon decks and sell them at a reasonable price, there was a ton of excitement. Wizards managed to back up this hype by printing a bunch of fun, powerful, and now iconic legends in those decks, including the most popular commander from the release, Kali of the Vast. 2012 Grizzlebrand from Avacyn Restored. Before 2012, if you want to cheat a creature into play, you'd have to think through a bunch of options. Did you want the protection of Inkwell Leviathan? Should you try to slow down your opponent with Tidespout Tyrant? What about gaining some life with Sphinx of the Steel Wind? But when Grizzlebrand released in Avacyn and restored, the equation changed. The mythic demon was, alongside Emrakul the Eon Storm, so strong that it was almost always the right choice to sneak, cheat, or reanimate onto the battlefield, a throne that it still holds today a decade later. 2013 Tarmogoyf from Modern Masters. The second reprint on our list, Tarmogoyf first showed up in Magic six years earlier in Future Sight, but thanks to the advent of the modern format, where Tarmogoyf was an ultra staple, its price exploded. At one point, 
point, a single copy of Tarmogoyf cost a massive $210, making the new modern format prohibitively expensive. This led to Wizards creating the Master series of sets, specifically to reprint important cards that had gotten too expensive, with the first release dropping in 2013 and Headland by Tarmogoyf. While it took many years in several reprints, the plan worked. Today you can snag a copy of Tarmogoy for 18 bucks, a 90% drop from its peak. 2014 Siege Rhino from Cons of Tarkir. Siege Rhino shows just how quickly the magic world can change. Today it's a quaint meme card, mostly played in janky brews, but eight years ago it was the most dominant card in standard to the point where there were conversations about banning it. It also saw play in modern and mid-range decks and alongside Birthing Pod. If you want to know more on the story of Siege Rhino, I'd highly recommend Ristic Studies video on the four drop which i'll link in the description 2015 Ugin the Spirit Dragon from Fate Reforged. The biggest, baddest, colorless planeswalker of all time, Ugin the Spirit Dragon has been dominating formats since the day it released. It's been a top tier card for two different runs through standard, a staple in modern Tron decks and legacy cloud post decks, and a go-to option is a sweeper in commander decks in colors that lack strong wrath options. 2016 Emrakul the Promised Dead from Eldritch Moon. While not obviously as scary as its predecessor Emrakul the Eons Torn, Little Emrakul quickly proved to be an incredibly strong option in Standard, where games quickly devolved into a battle of who could get their Emrakul on the battlefield first and steal their opponent's turn. This led to Emrakul being banned, kicking off a broken era of Standard, remembered for seemingly endless bannings. Between 2017 and 2020, 22 cards were banned in Standard, compared to the period from 2000 2006 to 2016, where a total of two cards, Jason the Mind Sculptor and Stoneforge Mystic, were banned. 2017, Hazareth the Fervent from Amonkhet. While Hazareth was a strong standard card and a staple of red aggro decks the entire time it was legal, there were two outside factors that lifted the god to icon status. One of the biggest developments in Magic in the late 2010s was the advent of lottery cards, special printings of cards that only showed up in a tiny number of packs, and Hazareth might be the most famous of the bunch. Thanks to it becoming a meme due to the nigh unreadable font of the Amica invocations, making it look like its name was Hazareth the Pervert, further cementing its icon status was its involvement in one of the biggest and most impactful punts in the history of the MTG Pro Tour. So Yam Wing Chun, with the Collective Defiance, he doesn't even need to use it to, to kill a creature. He can just, he, that's, a, that's a three damage burn spell for three mana. Hazard is five, so that Paulo is effectively at three. If he finds an incendiary flow, that will be the game. He could just kill him right here. Right. Incendiary flow? Is it a flow? See what he's got. It's a flow! It is a flow! Incendiary flow! Oh he my god! Yam Wing Chang just It's an incendiary it. flow off the top! Here. And look at this. No, no, he's you just, can't attack. You can't attack. He has only two cards in hand. He can't is he in his combat step? What's going on? He can't attack. Is he, oh, oh, that cost no. him the game. Oh, that cost him no. the game. That could cost Yam Wing Chun the game. He's oh, not my God. allowed to, collect, to attack with Hazaret. And if he's already moved into his combat step, it'll be too late for him to deploy one of the two sorceries in his hand and a huge head shake for him. What? 2018 Nexus of Fate from Corset 2019. After the Nelfani Dragon disaster in the early 90s, Wizards decided it was unwise to release new cards, his limited supply promos, but in 2018 they decided to break their own rules and printed new cards as buy a box promos. At first this was fine because the cards were mostly unplayable, but this changed in Corset 2019 with Nexus of Fate. Printed only as a foil buy a box promo, Nexus of Fate quickly rose to the top of standard, often looping itself for infinite turns with the help of mana from cards like Wilderness Reclamation. The supply of the card led to endless problems, with it spiking to nearly $200 on Magic Online and players being forced to use proxies in pro tour matches because the only real printing of Nexus of Fate was a curling foil that could be potentially recognized in the deck leading to a penalty for having marked cards. 2019 Oko Thief of Crowds from Throne of Eldorade. Most Magic players assume that Wizards would never print a Planeswalker stronger than Jace the Mind Sculptor, but most Magic players were wrong. In 2019's Throne of Eldorade, Wizards released Oko Thief of Crowds, which immediately broke Magic. In Standard, it was so dominant, we had a Pro Tour where over 70% of decks played Oko. It only lasted a couple of months before it was banned from the format. It lasted a bit longer in older formats, but was eventually banned everywhere except for Vintage 
damage. When asked about the Oko problem during a live stream, some of Wizard's comments made it sound like maybe the Planeswalker wasn't tested all that well, which combined with all the other bannings at the time, made some players question the effectiveness of the new play design team in charge of making sure that standard was well balanced. Here, let's just get it out of the way. Somebody's gonna ask, you know, hey, what's the deal with Oko? Why, what happened with Oko? What are your thoughts on Oko? Mm -hmm. um, so Oko had a goal to be a strong card in standard, but we did underestimate how strong the uh, plus one is on as a defensive ability to like remove other creatures and artifacts. 2020 Jeweled Lotus from Commander Legends. For most of Magic's first 30 years, iconic cards were tournament staples, but by 2020 this had changed with Commander Legends Jeweled Lotus. The Commander All-Star isn't even playable in any non-Commander format, but that didn't keep it from becoming the most hype and at around $90 most expensive card of its year. 2021 Aragavan Nimble Pilfer from Modern Horizons 2. 2021 will be remembered as the year that Magic's most most popular non-rotating format rotated, with Modern essentially becoming a brand new format thanks to the power of cards that Wizards released in Modern Horizons 2. While the overall power level of the set was incredibly high, no card exemplifies the 2020 era of magic design as much as this stupid monkey Raghavan Nimble Pilfer, as a one drop that can snowball into a win all by itself thanks to its ability to make mana and draw cards from the opponent's deck whenever it deals combat damage. 2022 Supply Llama, probably better known as Ethereum Sculptor, from Secret Lair. Technically a reprint, no card screams 2022 magic more than the Supply Llama version of Ethereum Sculptor. Part of a Fortnite crossover product, the addition of other IPs to magic in a tournament legal way has been one of the biggest conversations in the magic community over the past year. Love it or hate it, one thing's for sure. Supply Llama shows that even after 30 years in printing tens of thousands of cards, Wizards is still finding a way to keep the game fun, fresh, and profitable for better or worse. Thanks for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, help us out by clicking that like button down below. And to keep up on all the latest and greatest, click that subscribe button. And don't forget to hit that bell icon to get alerts whenever we have new videos. And if you want to, check out some of our other sweet videos here and here.